Hello, my name is Dr. Mitchell Hackerman. I'm with Physical Therapy and Balance Centers, formerly Pro-PT and Rehab Physical Therapy. We're located at 650 Town Bank Road in North Cape May. Feel free to check out our website at capemayphysicaltherapy.com, 609-884-9800. Hopefully you were able to attend our live presentation. If not, this is basically the presentation in a somewhat abbreviated form. I highly recommend you come to a live presentation, and I hope that you watch this through thoroughly and get a lot out of it. This presentation is entitled Train Your Brain to Reduce Your Pain. It's based on the works of Dr. Lorimer Mosley and Dr. David Butler. This is the Explain Pain Handbook, the Protectometer. If you are interested in obtaining a book, which I highly recommend, please give us a call, come in for a consultation, and this book could be part of our care. And here's some information about Dr. Mosley, who is a clinical and research physiotherapist. And you can certainly pause the video at any time to read this in detail. However, to expedite the process, I am not going to be uh, reading the entire thing here. And this is Dr. Butler. His information, feel free to pause again and read about Dr. Butler. Pain is a real pain. Physical suffering or discomfort caused by illness or injury. What makes pain? Your brain makes pain. Where else, where else can you feel pain? Of course, it's in the brain. We have millions of sensors sending trillions of messages to the brain. Some sensors respond to hot, cold, stress, movement, too much stretch, and can respond to damage. It triggers danger messages to the brain. These messages are not pain. They are messages for your brain to decide what to do with. So as I said, with no exception, pain is made by the brain 100% of the time. There can be lots of danger messages, but no pain. You can have injuries and no pain, and you can have pain and no injury. If you see an MRI and it shows damage, have you ever noticed or has anyone that you know noticed that once they see that an MRI shows damage that suddenly the pain increases? Your brain is making decisions on the experience it is happening. That is happening. Okay. Now think about family, friends who've had injury or and had pain episodes. Did the amount of pain always match the severity of their injury? Have you ever noticed a child that got injured and all of a sudden you make a panicked look on your face and all of a sudden that child reacts even more intensely? The amount of pain does not relate to the severity of the injury or changes, changes showing on x-rays or scans. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with who've had horrendous looking radiological reports, MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays, had a gentleman who heard me on the radio. He had pain in his legs. His physician had all sorts of studies done on his back. He came into the office, and if you looked at these films, you'd wonder how the guy's standing up. He's got bony spurs, degeneration, enlarged joints, enlarged facet joints, spinal joints, uh, deterioration, herniations, all kinds of things. The problem is, is he's never had back pain in his life, never. And with a little bit of testing and examination, we found no correlation to his symptoms to his back. Evaluations rule that out. And it turned out through further testing that I felt that he had possible blood clots in his legs. So I basically told him, look, I'm, I don't want to worry you. I just want to play it safe. I referred him back to his physician with a request that he see a vascular doctor. And when I heard from him later, sure enough, that's what it was. So the diagnostic findings did not correlate with his pain. But when you read diagnostic findings or the doctor tells you how bad they are, don't be surprised if your pain level goes up because Hearing these negative things has an effect on your brain and your perception of pain. 
it sensitizes your nervous system. We want to desensitize the nervous system. Now, what you believe and where you are. Question. If someone has a finger injury, who will tend to feel it more in, more strongly? Would a violinist feel it more strongly or a dancer? Well, obviously a violinist because a violinist is required to use their fingers. This has a potential effect on their career. So they're certainly going to be in a situation where they're much more focused on such an injury. Studies have shown that neck injuries following car accidents, if it's your fault, it will not hurt as much as if it's someone else's fault. And this has nothing to do with litigation, but think about it. If somebody else causes an accident that you're involved with and your neck gets hurt, you might be angry at that person, frustrated that he put you out of work and you won't be able to earn an income. All of these factors can lead to your pain, affect your pain experience. What hurts more? Injuring your knee after scoring a winning goal or the same exact injury falling at work? Think about it. You're playing soccer, you score the winning goal, and you injure your knee in the process. But you still have some more time left in the game. Well, you may not notice that pain or that there's even a problem until the next day. Maybe you won't have any pain. Maybe you'll just see swelling and you won't be able to walk on your knee. Or maybe that's when you feel the pain. If you have that same exact injury at work and you don't like where you work and you don't like your boss, that pain could be instant and severe. Why is that? Well, it has something to do with your brain now, doesn't it? Just to give you an example, Last year, I was driving home from the Poconos, and I had a really bad toothache. And I said, you know, I've got to get do something about this. I've got to find a pharmacy and get some tooth gel. Well, as soon as I pulled into the parking lot, wouldn't you know, the pain was completely gone. Well, why would that happen? How many times have you heard of somebody going into the doctor's office and they say, I don't believe it. Every time I walk into the doctor's office, the pain's not there anymore. Maybe you know somebody if it hasn't happened to, to you personally. But if you think in your past, you might be able to find a few in instances when, the, when it's happened. Now, had I not bought the tooth gel and I drove home without it, my brain would say, hey, uh, what's going on here? I thought you were taking care of business here. So... When I bought the gel, just before I bought the gel, my brain was satisfied. Oh, I'm taking action. And the pain went away. Now, that's not so easy for somebody who's had pain for a really long time because the longer you have pain, the better your body gets at experiencing pain. And I'll go into that in more detail as we move along. S studies have shown that those who are highly optimistic were less likely to report being bothered by symptom complaints than those who are less optimistic. Optimism, optimism, coping, and health. And here's the reference for the study. If you care to pause it, write it down, and obtain it, that's up to you. Another study. When people expected moderate pain and were exposed to severe heat, their pain ratings were 28% lower than when they expected severe pain and got it. Those who expected lower levels of pain experienced lower pain intensity. They found that positive expectations produced approximately 28% decrease in pain rating, ratings, and that's equal to a shot of morphine. Imagine that. You see the pattern here? You see where I'm going with this? Positive expectations is basically equal to a shot of morphine less expensive too. Other studies imagining movement in the mind without physically participating allowed stroke patients greater than six months since onset of non-traumatic and unilateral stroke to improve their gait pattern and ability to relearn daily tasks. That's simply by imagining movements. Now how is that possible? Think of a basketball player 
shooting a foul shot. They don't typically go up there and just throw the ball at the net. They rehearse the activity in their brain several times. While they're rehearsing it, the same cells fire that would fire if he actually did the activity. So when stroke patients imagine movement, even without physical active participation, it improved their gait pattern and ability to relearn tasks. Now why is that? Think about it. Why is Stephen Hawking still alive? Stephen Hawking's was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis at the age of 21. The survival rate is usually about three to four years from onset. About 10% survive longer than 10 years. Well, this guy's in his 70s already. How did he do it? This is completely hypothetical, and it's my personal opinion that Stephen Hawking regards his body as nothing more than a shell, and his brain is his playground. He is so interested in the universe, so interested in physics, that he's got a reason to live. Now, most of these patients will die when their muscles give out for breathing or for swallowing, and often they have to be intubated if they can't eat the normal way. But something's been keeping this gentleman alive for so long. And when you consider the work he's done throughout his career and how interested he is in science, that seems to me to point toward the power of the brain and motivation. He was able to block out all the negative things, focus on the positive things, and it gave him a reason to live. And here's some other studies you can look at. All right, I'm going to go on from there. What you know and understand. We know that the more knowledge about surgical procedures you have, the less pain medications you'll likely need. The less knowledge you have about your pain, the more it tends to hurt. You've heard of having pain from worrying, Helpful information from trusted source can make you feel better. Information is powerful. Well, why would more knowledge about a surgical procedure produce the need for less pain meds? Why would knowledge about your pain have an influence? Everything I'm talking about here is related to your brain, what your brain knows, how it reacts, how it responds to what it hears, sees, smells, touches, what you believe, a multitude of variables, influence, pain perception. So the formula here is, I will be in pain when the credible evidence of danger in me is greater than the credible evidence of safety in me. I will not be in pain when the credible evidence of safety in me outweighs the credible evidence of danger in me. That's the formula. Not easy to always apply, not going to happen overnight usually, but with persistence and patience, it can do incredible things for you. I'm finding it difficult for some of my patients to follow certain instructions, and I'll explain that a little further as we move along, because I want you to follow the instructions. If you have pain, you have to take responsibility, not just allow other people to do everything for you. As a physical therapist, I look for mechanical problems. For example, if you come into my office, I will ask you how your symptoms are influenced by various positions and movements. Based on that information, along with information that I gather by moving you and positioning you, that tells me what I need to do for my treatment. But we have to take it beyond that point. That's just the physical point. What about the mental point? If we treat both the cognitive and the physical, what we call mechanical, we have a much better chance at improving function. 
and reducing and even eliminating pain. And here we get to dims and sims. Coined words from doctors Mosley and Butler. Dims mean danger in me, sims are safety in me. Dims are anything dangerous to your body tissues, life, lifestyle, job, happiness, day-to-day -day function, a threat to who you are as a person. Sims, safety in me, anything that makes you stronger, better, healthier, more confident, more sure, and certain within and about yourself. Oh, and please disregard typos. <laughs> so, we're here at category one. What I'm going to do is skip on through to what this, this is referring to. This is category one. I will discuss it initially here. Things you hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. For example, danger in me might be, well, you look at an x-ray and you see all kinds of problems with it. And maybe the doctor doesn't clarify that for you. So you hear the changes that are shown in the x-ray and maybe you see them as the doctor points them out. Well, that's a dim. That's sensitizing your nervous system. Makes it more, it's a negative thing. It makes it more easy for your brain to experience pain. Now, maybe you hear the sounds of a dentist, or worse yet, somebody screaming in the dental office. Now, let's consider some sims, safety in me's. Hearing that my scan is all clear, well, that's a positive thing that might make you feel better. That's something you hear. Getting a gentle massage. Well, certainly that feels good. That's a positive thing. That can serve as a sim. Notice what we're trying to do is we want to, our sims to outweigh our dims. Now let me take you to the protectometer here just so you see what I'm talking about here. Okay, here's the protectometer. And this is category one as we just went over. What we hear, see, smell, taste, touch and you can find some that will be a dim and some that will be a sim and here you have the category here there are seven categories on this protectometer chart in this zone there's no pain up here you have zero to ten pain scale the higher up obviously the more pain you have and these things affect your pain obviously if you have a lot of dims it's going to increase, help your brain increase your pain perception. The more sims you have, the lower this goes and the less pain you'll experience. Now I'm going to go back up to the categories. Here's category two. Things you do. Okay, so think of some things you do. All right, danger in me. Well, I only take pills. I don't do anything else. I stay home all the time. Focusing on that, that's a negative thing. That can serve as a dim. Whereas a sim, if you do a little gentle exercise, you learn something about your pain. That's a positive thing that provides a sim. Again, we want our sims to outweigh our dims. On category three, we talk about things you say. So let's talk about danger in me. Ah, it's old age. I've got fibromyalgia. Well, nobody really explains to people what fibromyalgia is. It's just the catch-all diagnosis. It means you've got pain in your muscle. It's a diagnosis that's used to explain something that's not necessarily explainable. Some people may feel good by having that title because they feel that at least they found something. You can take some things as either dims or sims. It's all in context and how you define it. A sim in this category, well, you know what? There is a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm feeling positive about things. I know it'll take me a while to heal, but I'm confident I'll get there. I understand what's happening. All right, so things you say. That's category three. Category four involves things you think and believe. So let's think of some examples here. Danger in me, pain is forever. Oh man, the insurance has it out for me. Well, that can be stressful. So you can see how stress, negative stress, 
can sensitize your nervous system and affect your pain perception. Sims or safety in me's. Well, you know what? Broken bones can heal in six weeks. I can, I can deal with it. I have belief in my healthcare professional. All positive things. We want the sims to outweigh the dims or preferably get rid of the dims altogether. Category five, places you go. Well, some things can serve as both dims or sims depending on context. If you go to a hospital or a surgeon's office, it can be very nerve wracking. Maybe you don't have much information with you. You don't want to stay there. You don't like hospitals. You don't want to, you have the fear of needing surgery that can act as a dim. On the other hand, you might see the hospital as a positive place to be because they're going to help you. So you're not so fearful of going to the hospital because you know that they're there to help you. So it can serve as a sim. Depends on context and how you view it. It also depends on how much knowledge you have of your particular condition because knowledge is power. And the more you know about your condition, the more likely it is you'll be able to have control over your pain experience. Obviously, something like dancing class with your friend is a, is a pleasant thing. So that can serve as a sim. Category six, people in your life. Well, if you have a nosy neighbor or an out-of-date health professional, that can certainly be uh, send danger signals. Um, again, things can be dims or sims depending on context. Uh, sims, friends who understand me. I've got friends uh, I've got an up-to-date health professional. These are positive things. That serves as a sim. Category seven, things happening in your body. All right, well, if you're depressed, you're anxious, you have acute inflammation, certainly these can have an effect on your pain perception. Remember, your brain is making decisions here. And when you load up on DIMS, you sensitize the nervous system, making it more e easy to feel the pain that you're experiencing. And as I said before, the more, it's like if you play an instrument, a song on an instrument, enough times you get good at it, you don't have to think anymore. Well, guess what? The body, so too, will get good at something it repeats over and over again, such as pain. The longer it feels pain, the better it gets at feeling pain. That's the dark side of bioplasticity, which I'll go into a little more as we move along, uh, walking with a bad gait pattern. Some people have had an injured ankle or knee and they limp a lot. And even when the pain goes away, they continue to limp. Why? Because they repeated the faulty gait pattern for so long, their body got good at doing it. So you have to concentrate to reestablish symmetrical gait, which is certainly preferred. Now, under category seven, things happening in your body, as I said before, acute inflammation can serve as a dim or a sim. You need inflammation initially from an injury to start the healing processes. So context is everything. If it's lasting forever and it's just too long and it's just really bothering you, yes, it can act as a dim. All right, so here's your protectometer. Here's the indicator. It can go up and cause more pain, go down and less pain. Very low danger down here, very high danger up here. As you have evidence of danger, you move up the indicator up. Evidence of safety, it moves down. Okay. Now, here's your alert zone. This is when you going from no pain right into pain, and it may not take much for that to happen. So suppose you have some dims on one side. Ah, oh, you don't want to learn this new skill at work, but you have to do it. You don't want to be bothered with it. It's a negative experience for you. Maybe even being unfriended by someone on Facebook has you upset. Okay, maybe you're smoking more or doing un having more unhealthy habits. All right, now over here you have the sims. Well, I think I can deal with this. Positive attitude, that's a sim. Okay. Uh, you're feeling a bit fitter lately. That's a sim. Remember, we want the sims to outweigh the dims. But suppose you go outside and it's cold outside. It's very uncomfortable. 
that could actually put you into the alert zone where you just start to feel pain. So alert zone. You can have a sudden onset or increase in pain just by having one extra dim enter into the picture. And again, here is the protectometer. These are all the categories we just went over. Hear, see, smell, taste, touch. It's on both sides. Things you do. Things you say. Places you go. Things you think and believe. Things happening in your body. People in your life. The goal is to have your sims outweigh your dims. You want the best results, you make a list every single day and you try to make sure your sims outweigh your dims. There are such things called super dims which are really bad things and unfortunately many people experience bad things. They're going to be the toughest to deal with. You know, God forbid you have a loved one who passed, passed away your sim might be the memories you have of that person that will live forever in your mind and in those of your friends and family. There can be super sims as well. Fantastic things that have happened. You want to bin the dims, get rid of the dims, and you want to have as many sims as you possibly can. Okay, you can read through this. All right. Um, they basically help you explain such things as why a minor injury, such as a sprained ankle, can cause severe pain when there's lots of dims around. You could be worried about losing a job, fear your athletic career could be over, thoughts of surgery, etc. Whereas if you don't need to worry about such things, that same minor injury may not cause much pain for you. It's all about context. And here we is an example. We're in the alert zone. You got zero to one. Adding one more thing can tip it over. So he's got all these animals in here. And all of a sudden this bilby, which is a soft, small furred Australian marsupial on the endangered list, <laughs> it drops into the water and you have an overflow. And you start feeling pain. Okay. Again, you can read this on your own. Go from there. Now all kinds of chemical releases happen in response to danger. Adrenal glands release adrenaline and cortisol, which all has an effect on various body systems. That goes into a lot of detail. And we can do that on either in the clinic if you're interested or doing some self-research. Okay, this goes back to what I had mentioned earlier, bioplasticity. Living organisms adapt. We get stronger when we weight lift. We get smarter when we think a lot. We get fitter when we exercise. How your systems become more protective in the first place. It's how you can make them less protective again. So I gave you an example of somebody playing an instrument, learning how to play an instrument, or maybe you know how to play an instrument and you're learning how to play a song. You have to really concentrate initially, but after you've done it enough times, you don't even have to think about it anymore. I used to be in a, in a band myself many years ago. I could be on stage playing a song and thinking about what I have to do the next day, and I wouldn't skip a beat. Why? Because... I've adapted, my body's gotten used to doing it. It's through bioplasticity. I don't have to think about it so much anymore. I just do what I've learned to do through repetition. Your body feeling pain for so many years is repeatedly feeling pain. It gets good at feeling pain. The trick is to learn how to find the line between doing enough to make your systems adapt, but not so much that your protective systems flare up. Find your baseline. The amount of activity you can do that pain won't flare up. All right, clinical studies have shown that understanding your pain and committing to using bioplasticity to adapt your systems back to normal will slowly reduce your pain and disability. 
Now that's part of what we're going to show you how to do. We talked about the protectometer, your sims to outweigh your dims. You want to get rid of the dims if you can. And your body has to adapt. We also talked about imagery, imagining movements. Sometimes you can have so much pain, just thinking of a movement can produce the pain through your body. I watched a YouTube video of people swinging on a rope over a lake and the injuries that occurred from it, I could actually feel sh shots of, of strong nerve sensation through my legs. Now, how can that happen just by me watching that? Because we imagine ourselves in that situation and what it would feel like. Now, maybe with these examples, you're starting to understand where we're going with this. And if you've had any doubts about this, hopefully you're starting to realize that all of this stuff is plausible and is based in science. So as I talked to you about before, the dark side of bioplasticity, the longer your nervous system has been protecting you, the better it gets at doing it. Nerves that convey danger messages to your brain become more sensitive and the brain cells that make your pain become more sensitive too. All sorts of things that didn't hurt now hurt. All your systems are adaptable. It may show up with changes in your movements, your emotions, even physiological responses such as sweating. But all your systems are adaptable. You can let all these negative things in your attitude create a physical manifestation. If you're not doing much of anything, you're sitting around the house gaining weight, uh, your muscles are getting weak, your body's getting weak, you're getting less mobile, your muscles are, your body's getting also less stable. Now, the protectometer becomes more sensitive to dims and moves upward and more likely to be an alert. All right, on the positive side, you can learn how to use, how to lower the protectometer to a normal state. Learn to be less protective. Learn to move differently, breathe differently, speak differently, think and behave differently. The more you practice, the better you become as is the case with everything in our lives. Why is somebody good at something that you're not good at? Because they do it all the time. You won't be good at it initially when you try, but with repetition, you get better at it. Why does somebody limp after their, their ankle or their knee or their hip has healed, but they're still limping? Because of repeated, repeating the bad gait pattern over and over again while they were injured and in pain. Now that everything's healed and they no longer have pain, they're still doing it, have to retrain to walk normally again. Adapting your system back to normal won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Learn to switch off and turn down your protective systems. Fear of pain and no pain, no gain. That can turn up your protective systems. Everything then hurts. The brain learns to make pain with less and less activity. Respect and understand and do not fear pain. Use the power of bioplasticity on your road to recovery. So think about what your favorite things are to do. Walking, running, dancing, computing, working. You want to be able to just sit in a chair. Maybe you can't do that driving in a tractor, anything else? Uh, you can stop and read this because these questions are repeated down the road in the next few slides or so. Okay, now we talk about tissue tolerance. That's an activity level that can damage your tissues. What is your tissue tolerance? Obviously, it's not what it used to be, is it? The older we get, the more pain that we have, Tissues may become damaged more easily. There's a protect with pain level. That's the activity level that just that causes your pain. That's underneath where the tissues can actually get, where you're reaching tissue tolerance when the tissues can get damaged. You could just be overdoing it, push too hard, too fast. You might injure your tissues, your muscles, your ligaments. You might be able to do some things while in pain. There's more dims than sims. Protective systems kick in. 
the protectometer is pushed into the pain zone. So here we go. Here are those questions again that you saw on the other slide. We have a mountain drawn here. This is your tissue tolerance, activity level that can damage tissues. So that's right up in here. You have pain, you push too hard, too fast, and you injure tissues. Please forgive the typos. This is your protect with pain. This is the activity level that causes pain. This might cause pain. This is where pain damage is at the top. This is doing it in pain. More dims than sims. Protective systems kicked in. Protector, protectometer pushed up into the pain zone. This here, this area, this is activity you used to do a lot prior to your current troubles, whether it be walking, running, dancing, computing, working, or other. What you could do comfortably, okay? This is your foundation here, situation before your pain started. So answer any and answer these questions. Are you doing as much now as back then? Yes or no? Are you as fit now as back then? Yes or no? Do you sleep as well as you did back then? Are you as young as you were back then? Are you medication free? Do you eat as well as you did back then? Do you move as well? Are stress and anxiety levels the same as they were? So if you've answered no to any of these, then certainly your everything comes down. Maybe your tissue tolerance is down here now. Maybe your protect with pain is down a little further at the beginning of the mountain or the middle of the mountain. Okay, so how you used to be. Before you had problems, you could comfortably work, run, play, undertake life's other activities. Your brain will protect you with pain before you reach tolerance level of the tissues. It makes it safe for you to explore. <coughs> Just thinking about doing it, thinking of watching an activity fires up large areas of your brain, and it might make pain. So here we go. This is a mountain with a bunch of mountain climbers. They're trying to achieve a goal. In this case, they're trying to reach the mountain peak. Now, we would use any number of goals that we might have. Maybe it's uh, walking for some people. Maybe it's playing tennis for another person. Maybe it's just being able to sit in a chair. All those examples I gave before. We're going to use walking as an example. So we have to climb that mountain. How much do I want to do? Well, my ultimate goal will be to be able to walk for an hour. That would be great. How much would it take to really flare me up, though? So say you've noticed that your flare-up point is around 30 minutes. That's where it really starts to flare up and get bad. How much does it take to make me hurt now? That should protect with pain point. Well, say walking for five minutes. Once established, protect with pain and flare-up points your base camp can be set up anywhere you feel you can cope between these points. Between five minutes, that's the distance you can walk before you start to hurt. And 30 minutes is the flare-up point. Maybe yours is really bad and less, but you, no matter what it is, you can always work something out. Your body will adapt over time if you're patient and bring a lot of sims with you and bin the dims, meaning get rid of the dims or minimize them or override them with more sims. Safety in me's over danger in me's. Here we are at base camp before the mountain climb for anything in life you'd like to return to. We're gonna take a backpack on our trip with us. As I said to you before, Get rid of the dims. Get rid of the negative attitude. Get rid of your fear for, of movement. Get rid of sugary foods and fried foods. Make sure you get rid of um, your, since your emotional problems, feeling that you have no hope, you have no plans. Stops. Make sure you have a good night's sleep. Over here on the positive side of things, on the Sims, keep a positive attitude. 
have good companions around you, have detailed plans, and always have hope and inspiration. Fitness and mobility, warm clothes, wholesome food, good coach, patience, perseverance, useful knowledge about your pain, supportive friends. Maybe you want to take a walk with a friend. Maybe somebody's got something similar to you, and they could benefit from this. And as you see each other progress, that's a very motivating thing. So you're going to do a little more of the activity each day. Not much more, just a little. Small increases every few days or even weekly. You will confront certain dims along the way while maintaining the same amount of activity. Okay. Always add extra sims. Go back to your protectometer. Think of positive things. Maybe it's a cold, crisp day and it just feels good to be out there. That could serve as a sim. Obviously, if it's too cold, that may serve as a dim. But if you dress warmly enough, it can serve as a sim. Maybe there's beautiful fall. It's a fall day and there's beautiful colored leaves on the trees. Maybe you hear birds chirping in the background or maybe you can just enjoy looking at life around you. All of these things have an effect. Taking activity out of a safe place, the home or the clinic, and into the workplace. All right. Now, if you've gone a little too far, you back off a little or keep going with the same amount of activity, but with some extra sims. Plan your progress. Write down your goal. You will walk for 30 minutes three times a week or sit and use a computer for one hour daily. It depends on what your personal goals are. And then plan your next steps. Okay, so here's a bunch of examples of things you'd like to possibly do better than you do now. These are all paceable things. These are things you can improve at doing over time. Pack plenty of sims for the climb, the mountain climb, and throw out any old weighty dims. So here we go. Stage one, we're at base camp. We want to climb that mountain. In this case, it involves walking. So if it takes me five minutes of walking to, to make me hurt, but 30 minutes to really flare up, I think I can cope with walking about 10 minutes. Stage two. Okay, you begin your ascent up the mountain. Basically, you're, say you walked for three minutes. Well, seek out sims, positive thoughts, beliefs. Um, think about the people in your life. You might have to face some dims along the way. If you face some dims, gather more sims, whether it it is a nice aroma in the area, whether it's looking at a cute animal uh, scurrying by. Gather those sims. Think of a f funny stories in your mind or talk with a friend as you're both walking. Talk about positive things. Stage three. You continue your ascent up the mountain. So you walked maybe six minutes, still seeking out sims and facing some dims. Your dim might be fear of movement again. Well, override that with positive thoughts and beliefs. And any other kind of sim you can use to outweigh this fear of, your mo of movement. Get rid of your fear. Stage four, you continue your ascent up the mountain. Wow, here we have uh, seven minutes. All right, same things, gathering your sims, minimizing or getting rid of your dims or confronting your dims. Some dims you may not be able to get rid of, but you can confront them and overcome them. Come them. Congratulations, you made it. You walked 10 minutes without pain. That's adaptation. That's a positive side of bioplasticity. You couldn't do this before. You may have had pain at five minutes before, but now you've changed that. Now you don't feel pain until 10 minutes. So you want to set a new goal. 
you want to be able to walk 20 minutes without pain in, say, two weeks. Now, we have our own built-in drug cabinet in our own brains. And we have a key to the drug cabinet. We can use those keys to turn our own natural chemistries, chemistry on in our brain and release feel-good chemicals. And if you can do that, obviously you'll need less pain medication. This is an image that shows the brain after just sitting quietly. And this is the brain after 20 minutes of walking. It in triggered endorphins, those natural chemicals I was just talking about. All right, this is actually what happens. Now, you can imagine that if you have pain when you walk, that may not produce any um, that may not produce any of this release of chemicals. But when you get to the point of being able to walk for a distance and not have an issue, then you're free to enjoy the walk and have the release of your brain's own natural drug cabinet. Use your own drug cabinet. And here's a list of things that occur. They can block dims. They, they can keep your protectometer in the no pain zone, even with severe injury. They're free. There's no side effects. They're available to you 24-7 all year round, including holidays. The brain decides making pain is not going to help you at a particular moment. You can switch on the drug cabinet and let, and let happy hormones just pour out. Now here's the key to your own drug cabinet. Knowledge can switch the cabinet on. Dims such as fear can switch it off. So you look at this list and tell me what would turn the key on and release those natural brain chem chemicals is feel-good chemicals and what would turn them off. If you feel supported and cared for by your family, obviously that would turn on the drug cabinet. You're about to lose a sports final and you just had an injury. Well, if you're about to lose and you have an injury, wouldn't you think that that's a negative experience? You would turn off the drug cabinet? Now, suppose you're about to kick the winning goal and you have just had an injury. Well, if you just kicked the winning goal, you could very well override. Your brain can prioritize and focus on the win. And you're so happy that you won the game that your drug cabinet can still be turned on, even though you just injured yourself. You may not feel that pain or even have pain. You may notice swelling the next day with some pain, it's individual, of course, but initially that drug cabinet is turned on because you just did something positive. Different outcome, whether you win or lose, right? Having the same injury. You're being examined by someone who hasn't really explained what they're doing. Obviously, that's not going to help release any chemicals in your brain, but someone giving you a nice warm hug would turn on that cabinet. If you drive by the place where you had an accident, well, I wouldn't think that would turn on the drug cabinet. That could be a negative experience for you. All right. You can pause and read this about pharmaceuticals. Scans and x-rays nearly always show something and you really need to ask the, the doctor, physician, whoever you're dealing with, a simple question. Because when they show you some of these MRI reports or x-ray reports and they sound, they say all kinds of th things that are negative, like degeneration, wear and tear, those are dim words. You know, they might even make you feel, feel ill. But ask them a question when they show you these reports and findings. Doctor, how common are these findings 
in the average population without pain because you will learn that those findings are very common and don't necessarily cause pain. They're just often just natural, often they're natural changes that occur with age. And that doesn't mean you're going to have pain. In fact, I believe a lot of studies have been showing that the older we get, the less pain we have, even with all the changes that occur. One reason is, is we get the fluid in our discs gradually uh, deplete. So there's basically less that can go wrong. When you have a lot of fluid in your disc and you're very active and you do something, that fluid has a much easier time becoming a problem. But when you have less of it, you might be very stiff or, or stiffer or have less mobility, but it doesn't mean you're going to have pain. Now certainly if you have less mobility, theoretically speaking, if you take a joint to its end range of available motion, such as uh, catching a box off of a shelf and it forces your back to bend backward quickly, if you don't have a lot of good mobility there, maybe you can get injured a little more easily. But overall, as we get older and have more degeneration, we tend to have less pain. Everyone's different. Of course, I see people who are at various ages who have pain and chronic pain. Everyone's different. But if you've had pain for a really long time, even if the tissues are in good shape, you can still have that pain because your brain got really good at feeling that pain through repeated experiences, diagnoses. You've heard of them before. Fibromyalgia, collapsed arch, whiplash, spinal instability, syndrome, sounds dangerous and can be serve as dims. Words can take over your life and define what you do, what you think and affect places you go and the people in your life, even your biological state. Don't let it become a super dim. That will constantly push your protectometer up. You have to bin the dims, get rid of them. All these diagnoses, bulge disc, ruptured, bone on bone, degeneration, compressed, all of these things can have a negative effect on your pain perception. Throw them out, get rid of them. They're not needed because these things do not necessarily mean you're going to have pain or that they are the cause of your pain. Many people have these problems and do not have pain. Here's another look at the protectometer. Feel free to pause it and look it over. There's a few examples given to you. Ever notice the multiple diagnoses you get from various health professionals? You've heard me mention fibromyalgia many times. Now here we have these very scientific sounding names and they can sound menacing. Or as I said before, some people like having a name to something because it gives them some sort of answer. So again, it depends on context, how you take it. Fibromyalgia just means pain in muscles and ligaments. Somatoform pain disorder just means pain due to neurosis, like a, which is a mild mental illness involving symptoms of stress, like depression, anxiety, obsessive behavior, etc. Chronic fatigue syndrome just means you're always tired. Mild fascial pain syndrome, pain in the muscles related to fascia. Nonspecific back pain, low back pain, not caused by anything in particular. Psychosomatic pain, pain caused by thoughts and emotions. Repetitive strain injury, pain started by repetitive movements. Nonspecific neuropathic pain, pain caused by faulty nerves. All can be explained by sensitization of the central alarm system. Again, you have sensors throughout your body. They feel hot, cold. They feel all kinds of things. They send those messages to the spinal cord, up to the brain. Your brain makes a decision what to do with them. You can pause this and read this in detail if you like. It gets into more detail about 
what we call the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. A very interesting read if you care to read up on it. Read through this at your leisure. Google some of the information if you're that interested in it. That's up to you. Moving along, here's more information. Talks about cortisol, which is a stress chemical. Feel free to put this on pause and read through it. Now we're going to play a game. And this game is based on left-right discrimination. We call it laterality. It's been found that, for example, somebody who has an acute, say they have an acute right hand injury. Well, they might be very focused on that hand. If you show them a picture of a hand and you ask them to guess what hand that picture is, the right or the left, they're likely to call out the hand that is involved because they're so focused on it. They're so focused on the injured hand. Now, if they have chronic pain, and they've had that, that hand pain for maybe several years, and someone shows a picture of a hand, they are likely to guess the opposite hand, their non-involved hand, because they're trying to avoid having to even think of that hand. So if they show a picture of a right hand and you've had right hand chronic pain, you may guess left hand because your left hand is fine. You don't want to any attention paid to the right hand. If you've acutely injured your right hand and they show you a picture of either the right or left hand and it's a recent injury, since you're so focused on it, you might guess that it is your involved hand, your right hand, because at that time you're focused on it. Whereas in the chronic situation, you don't want to even have to deal with it anymore. You just want to ignore it. So you tend to guess the picture is something of the uninvolved hand. So they've shown that with chronic pain, people's ability to distinguish between left and right becomes impaired. And you can actually train someone to improve their ability to determine the difference between left and right. And you can do that through pictures. You can use magazines and look at the model's hands and tell yourself whether it's the right hand or the left hand or the right foot or the left foot. You can look at people walking by in a mall and determine which body part it is that correlates with your body part that's injured and try to guess whether it's left or right and they've shown that people who've had chronic pain for some time lose that ability to distinguish between left and right but practicing it over and over again improves it and there's different ways to practice it you could look at a picture in its normal state just a body part and guess whether it's right or left after seeing it or you might see that body part in a functional position somebody's arm is over their head and the hand is hanging down and you guess which hand it is so we're going to play a little game here, and you're going to say whether the image you see is either the right side or the left side. And I'm only going to give you two seconds or so to guess what it is. These are not very hard. It's just to give you an example. There is a program on my tablet I have in the office which has many, many pictures, and it gets a lot more challenging than what I'm going to show you here. But just to give you an example, we will play a little game here. So suppose you have an injured foot and you've had it for a long, long, long time. Your ability to, to determine right and left could be impaired. So take a look at this next image. I want you to tell me whether it's the right or the left. And here we go. Was that the right or the left? It was the left. Tell me if it's right or left. It's the right foot. Okay, now, right or left? It is the left. All right. Right or left? And it is the left. Right or left hand? Right hand. Right or left hand? Right hand. Right or left, shoulder, it's the right. Right or left, side bend, it's the right. Right or left foot, it's the right foot. Right or left foot, it's the left foot. Right or left trunk rotation, 
x to the left trunk rotation. Right or left rotation, left trunk rotation. Left or right hand, x to the left hand. Well, that was quite an endeavor to get through this entire presentation. I hope you find the information useful. I believe it can be very useful, but it depends upon how much effort and time you're willing to put into this. Work on your imagery, work on your protectometer, work on visualization. It's important to treat both the physical and mental and emotional components of pain. It's not so much your aptitude, but your attitude that determines your altitude. Always keep positive. Do not allow things to get you down. Use your protectometer. Use the lessons in this presentation, and you can achieve things that you never knew you could achieve. It's all about bioplasticity. Introducing Body Q, a state-of-the-art diagnostic tool that measures the health and wellness of the muscles, joints, neurological systems, and overall functionality of the human body. Developed by medical professionals, physical therapists, nutritionists, vestibular and balance experts, Physical's proprietary Body Q is changing healthcare by providing a proactive approach to staying healthy. Body Q provides a quick and comprehensive evaluation measuring musculoskeletal function, range of motion, balance, hearing, and vision. Once completed, Body Q will calculate your overall Body Q health score and generate a comprehensive report designed to help you prevent injuries and address potential health issues before they become serious. Next, a healthcare professional will analyze your Body Q score. Based upon the findings, if necessary, a plan of care will be developed specifically for your body's individual needs that may include a medically-based fitness program, physical therapy, or a physician referral. Take control of your health with BodyQ, available only at physical therapy and balance centers. Spelled different because we are different. At Physical Therapy and Balance Centers, you will enjoy a safer and more effective way to undergo physical therapy. Our new safety overhead support expedites healing and makes falls a thing of the past. If you are at risk of falling or suffer from a balance or dizziness disorder, the safety overhead support eliminates the fear of falling, allowing you to move beyond your limitations, recover quickly, and regain your independence. Your safety is our focus. No fears, no falls. Love your life. Call us today to discover the pinnacle of healthy living. Physical. Spelled different because we are different.